It's officially springtime. And of course, that means it's time to start spraying the house for all those warm weather bugs. Believe it or not, I've got more than one story about this. And in the news, I've got cell phone face masks and more than a couple of stories about being under the influence. And speaking of under the influence, this week's featured podcast is Ice and the Face. Evening Hot Dad Out Podcast in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Odd Dad Out Podcast, where normal is not my specialty. I am your host, Adam Higgins, the Odd Dad Out, and this is the show where I share my weird little stories and make fun of new stuff and get a little nerdy and get a little snarky and just have fun with stuff. So, like I said, it's officially springtime. I know I did that whole, it seemed like it's spring already. The irony of it is, this week it's going to get down into the 60s. It has been in like the mid to upper 90s for the last fucking week. And now that it's officially spring, as of Monday, we're going to have this like chill drop and we're going to be down into the 60s. It's like the coldest it's been in weeks. And again, yes, I realize that, you know, 65 degrees is summer weather for some places. For me right now, this is a big temperature swing. I just got my air conditioner fixed on Friday on my van, and now I'm not going to need it. It's actually spring break here. My son's actually off of school. So uh, now that it's spring break and it's and go out and party, oh yeah, it's going to chill a bit and it's not going to be so warm. But that's actually not the point. I'm not here to bitch about the weather. Uh, it's actually a kind of a funny thing. So like I, I've mentioned before about how... I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a, I'm a jackass of all trades. I can do, I can do a million things and I can't. And it's one of those things where we paid for pest control and all this stuff for so many years. We had a contract, one of those like, Hey, they're going to come out and every three months they'll spray the house and just make, and do basically like pest control maintenance. Fine. $90. Every three months. And when you really look at it, that's not that expensive. It really is. It was like, oh, like 30 bucks a month. And it was like, oh, it's guaranteed. And if you need them to respray any time during that 90 days, not a problem. They'll come back and respray for free because you've got a contract. Not a big deal. Well, when you have to fulfill that contract and like that month where you've got to pay the pest control guy, I'm like, well, fuck, I don't have, it's like, and we were fucking broke. It's like, I don't have $90 today right now in my budget to pay the pest control guy. So next thing you know, you've got roaches or whatever. I don't know. To be fair, if they're doing a good job, you really shouldn't need them every three months. I'm just going to say that. But, you know, that starts adding up. It really does. And I kind of committed to, once we got out of, like, fulfilled that whole contract with that pest control, like, ah, dropped the contract, we moved, you know, that was a couple of houses ago, but I decided, hey, it's really not that hard. I've seen what the guys do, I know what it is, and anybody who's seen any pest control guy come into your house, a lot of them are lazy as shit, unless you're getting, and I'm not promoting them at all. Not even the guys I used. But unless you get like the Terminex guys that are sitting there doing like a deep core termite treatment and like a deep penetrating your house and all that stuff because you've got like a serious infestation of something, they're probably walking around with an air, like with a a compressed air or whatever the hell, with a, a pump of chemical and they're just sitting there like spraying a little bead of, uh, preventative, just like that little, you know, border spray that they all do. And it's just like, like around all the edges and everything. And it takes them like five minutes and then they're done. And they're like, Oh yeah, $90. Uh, what? So when I first got in with those, like the, the pest control contract guys, when they first came out to my house, they're like, yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to treat your entire house on the exterior. It's like, we're going to spray granules in your yard to kill any yard pests. And we're going to put a barrier down. 
in your yard or like on your house. Like we're going to go halfway up the wall and we're going to have halfway out in the, into the, the pavement. So like, like three feet up the wall and three feet out from the wall. So that besides the fact that the yard itself is going to be, uh, have granules of pesticide that you just water them in and then your entire yard is pest controlled, whatever. Incidentally, didn't do shit for the ants, but whatever. I, they're like, all right, yeah. And then they come out with the big hose on the trucks and it looks like they're power washing my house and pesticide. And they're like, son of a bitch, they are serious. And this was like the deep first time treatment. And they're like, as we told them, like, we got scorpions, like son of a bitch. So we need whatever, kill the damn scorpions. So they come out, they do that. And they're like, yeah, three feet up and three feet out and put this big barrier so that they got across three feet of poison sidewalk to get to your house. And even if they do, the house itself has a huge poison wall that they have to scale and all this sort of stuff. Um, scorpions are some really resilient motherfuckers. I will tell you that because I have had them still get into the house. Now, to be fair, they usually die pretty quickly. If they didn't die outside, they don't make it very far into the house, but they made it into the house. So always watch out for your scorpions. But after seeing all that, and then after that, it was just kind of the, oh, we're going to come along and we're going to spray your your corners. And <coughs> excuse the coughing. It actually is going to be relevant here in a second. But uh, I decided, you know what? I'm just, uh, this is too expensive. I can't afford to do it anymore. I know the process at this point. So what I did after all of that was over and I knew kind of what they needed to do, what they did. As I started looking into doing it myself, uh, my brother's, uh, wife, her family, very do it yourself, or they actually would buy like commercial grade pesticides because they had like a big, like ranch property. And so they would actually get like the commercial grade pesticides at like the feed and tax store, like, and stuff like that. And they would treat the whole house and then they started spraying and like putting a perimeter down and doing all this whole thing. So basically, you're not going to find bugs on their property that didn't fly in. And once they flew in, they touched something and die. But they got really good. They're like no ground bugs, no cockroaches, no scorpions, none of that because they put this huge perimeter on their house. But which was cool. And it just kind of gave me that same idea. I'm like, you know what? I bet I could do that. I wonder what this is. And so I look into, and I just like, you can find it on Amazon. No shit. Commercial grade, like straight up, this is the concentrate that commercial pest control uses. Uh, commercial grade pesticide. Pretty much broad spectrum pesticide kills just about everything. And it's even, oh, for termites. And it's got the whole big old, big ass chart of, oh, if you're trying to target this, this is how you do it. And it's got all the instructions. And so that's what I've, I've been doing that. So that being said, it's time of year. It's like, Hey, it's warmed up over this last weekend because it was St. Patrick's day and my anniversary and it was a weekend. And it's like, I'm off of work on Sunday. So this last week I decided, Hey, I really, it's warming up. I've got the time. I need to spray the house. Like I've said before, we've had a couple of scorpion incidents recently. I had one this, this past week, you know, bring in the dumpsters off of the curb and there's a scorpion. Fuck that. Got to get rid of the scorpions. So I just, it's time. Got to spray the house. It's warming up. They're starting to wake up and we're seeing stuff. We're seeing flies and, and stuff I'm like, ah, just deal this, get rid of the bugs now. Uh, so fun part. I got to order a new backpack sprayer. You know, this like big old, you know, big tank you wear. It looks like an old super soaker and you sit there with the hand pump and pump it all up and the wand and all that stuff. Uh, because I used to use like, you know, the, the little like weed sprayer hand pump, just walk around thing. I used to have one of those. Well, I still have that, but I used to use that for spraying the house. Well, just like the big pest control guys, the instructions on this stuff. And I buy, and again, it's a concentrate. I use like, it's for those of you who want to do the concentrations in the math, I use one ounce of this, this mix to a gallon of water. It's, it goes pretty far. I think it says it's supposed to treat like 300 square feet or something like that. If you lay it on real thick, but I was using that thing to spray my yard 
or my house. And it's it works and it's fine, except for the sheer fact that I have big houses. At the very least, it's a it's wide and it's a long walk to go all the way around. And even if I'm just spraying the perimeter, just like doing like the the cheap, you know, bug spray guy, and just I'm just going to spray a line down at the at the ground. It takes more than one gallon to get all the way around the house if you're really laying it on good. Not to mention inside and spraying the garage doors and all that stuff. But I'm not just laying that little bit down. I'm putting that big ass fucking perimeter because that's what the instructions on this stuff say to do. That for, you know, optimization, hey, put that big ass perimeter three feet up, three feet out away from the house. That's what I'm doing and I'm laying that shit on thick because I hate scorpions. Really, every other bug I can I can somewhat deal with. We had a cockroach problem when we moved into this house. Don't anymore. But I've I I'm laid this shit on thick, so it would take me four plus gallons to get around the house. After a while you get tired of refilling that stupid thing. So I talked my wife into letting me get one of those sprayers. Like, yes, I got a backpack sprayer, I can do the entire house. <coughs> I can go and Spray the entire house in one big thing. I fill it up once and it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And I've got the big wand and I can spray everything and I'm all excited. I've got a new toy for the yard because I never get new toys for the yard. Incidentally, I totally need to get a new weed eater right now. And mine's totally crapping out. I mean, how did I have to mow the yard every week? But I got my new backpack sprayer toy and I get it all put together and I go and fill it up and spray the house and I'm a dumbass, and so I start spraying up the walls, and I, when I do it, I spray up the walls, pretty much up to, like, the window line, you know, and I spray all the way around all the windows, and I actually go up and I spray in the, the underhang, or the overhang, whatever the fuck it is, under the, the roof line, all of it, all these little places and nooks and crannies where bugs could hide and be sneaking into the house. I spray all of it. Except... When I did this on Sunday, it was windy as fuck. Now, I'm not like a complete idiot. There are tons of warnings on this stuff. This is industrial grade pesticide after all. So I, it has on there, big ass warning. Always, you know, socks, shoes, long pants, long sleeve shirt, uh, face mask, cover your hair. I do it all. I've got my hair covered got a bandana on, I've got long sleeves, even though it's 85 fucking degrees, long sleeves, gloves, boots, everything, big uh, fucking face mask, you know, I already wear big ass thick glasses, so the only parts of my face that are exposed at all are basically anything around my glasses, between my glasses and the outside of this face mask, it's about the only part of my body that's exposed, apparently that little bit of exposure is enough to poison me. Because since spraying all the pesticides, I've been a little short of breath. Uh, I've had a cough. I've been really congesty and stuffy and all that sort of crap. And my wife's like, oh no, you're you're dehydrated because we went to the zoo the other day and I wasn't really drinking a lot of water and it was hot and all that crap. But she's like, oh no, you're dehydrated and you're sick. Like you, you just need to hydrate better. Like I've been drinking water and tea and coffee and I'm not dehydrated. I'm poisoned. Like, how do you know you're poisoned? Because I remember what this feels like because this isn't the first time that I've gotten myself sick from pesticides. Uh, to be fair, last time I didn't sit there and dose myself. This was a side effect of I'm spraying to this time. I was like, I was up spraying the house and spraying up the side of the house when I realized, oh shit, I'm facing the wrong direction. I'm spraying this up and it's blowing right in my face. Now I'm fucked. Now again, part of the whole process, as soon as I'm done spraying, I strip, I like strip everything off in the garage, close the garage door, of course, but I take everything off immediately goes right into the washer, bandana included. Everything goes right in the washer, and I wash all of my bug spray clothes separate. Uh, but I remember this feeling, much like many illnesses I have, much like bronchitis and a bunch of other crap. I remember the feeling of being pesticided. 
I, in our previous house, back when we had professional pest control, we had some really big bushes, uh, yellow bells, if you're familiar with them. I don't even know if that's the official whatever the hell name. They call them yellow bells out here. Really pretty shrubbery. They're like almost like a tree, but it's like a shrub that gets really big. It has really big flowers and sheds like a son of a bitch and it drops all of its leaves every year. Well, we had one of these on the side of our house that I hadn't trimmed in the three years that we had this house. I hadn't trimmed it. I really wasn't taking care of it. And it got really overgrown. And so we had one in the front. I started and was like, you know, what? I'm going to trim this up because there could be something living in it. There could be spiders. There could be scorpions. It's it's just kind of a – and it's a huge plant. And I was like, I'm, I want to get rid of this. I want to trim it back, make it look more neat and clean up the side of the house because there's leaf, leaf litter and crap everywhere. So I go – and I, I take our oldest boy, he was God, maybe three, four years old, but he's always been really helpful because, you know, oldest son and all that. He goes and he's out there with me. And so I'm out there trimming the tr- the bushes and all this. And we said, okay, now let's get the rake. We're going to rake up all these leaves and we're going to bag them all up and throw them in the dumpster and it'll be a good day. And look, make the side of the house look all great. Well, we, and we do that and we're like, yeah, it's all and get got four bags of all this crap and get it all and everything looks great and we're feeling great it was like really accomplished and then the next day we're both sick and we're like why we're just thinking now oh, we're sick and it's gonna spread around the house like you know illnesses do but then nobody else got sick and we start we go out in the garage and i was like why does the whole garage smell like bug spray like if you took a raid bomb and just set it off in the garage. Just the garage. Just everything. Super heavy. You can't escape that. Like, you open the door and just get boom with bug spray aroma. Like, why the hell does everything smell like bug spray? And then we realize it's the bags. It's all the leaves. All the leaves that were on the ground and that were on the ground on the side of the house when the guys came and hosed the house down with uh, heavy pesticides and saturated everything on the ground because all those leaves were on the ground and just got soaked. And all these leaves were wet. So they all got soaked in pesticide multiple times. And whenever the guys would come around, I was like, Fuck. And we were sitting there like face first in this stuff, shoving it into bags. And it's me and my four year old. We're just shoving shit into bags. We didn't think anything of it. We were just, hey, we're doing yard work. And you know why the leaves wet? Because the ground gets wet and it rains and the sprinklers and whatever, and shoving leaves in bags. And the next thing you know, we're both sitting there held over with hun- like hundred something fevers and can't hardly breathe and coughing and our sinuses are flared to son of a bitch. And, yeah, my wife is getting busy. You're going to kill my baby. I'm like, I'm not going to kill him. I didn't poison him. We were, I was dumb and we got pesticided. Uh, but, <laughs> so, I, I'm familiar with how pesticides re- uh, treat the body. I'm not eating it or anything. Otherwise, I'd probably be dead. But, you know, it doesn't take much of inhaling uh, pesticides to where you start getting those sort of, but that's basically, it it feels like a cold without the fever. It's like all of the symptoms of being sick without a fever. So I've got the, the, the sinusy runny nose, stuffiness, scratchy throat. I've got a cough. So I'm not bothering to hide them because it's too much to deal with right now, but it's all just like, poisons in my that I breathed in unfortunately which sucks and I probably should like use my inhaler or something to help me breathe but I don't know I'm stupid like that but yeah I'm it's I'm I'm very familiar it's like I know I'm I just poisoned myself that's it I'm not sick I was sick last week when the boys got everybody sick I'm just poisoned now because you know that's totally a better thing ah <sighs> But that's just kind of part of me and me being stubborn. And yeah, because I'm a dumbass like that. 
because I want to do everything myself. I also have like I I still need to go and spray the backyard for weeds. I've managed to get my wife to agree that yes, I can get a new weed eater and I need a new lawnmower and all this and new new toys for the yard to maintain. Yeah, I I totally need new toys because my lawnmower died and my weed eater's dying and and I needed a backpack sprayer and all these fun little doodads and whatnot. So all these little things that get to go along with we've got tax return money that we can spend on the house upkeep. So I get new toys for house upkeep. Upkeep. Yep. Because I can talk right. Okay. Now that I've, I've shared my, my tales of pesticidiness, I'm going to take a quick break and I will be right back with the news. <laughs> Uh, is it working? I think so. I don't. I don't know. The thing is on. Well, I, I know, but I wanted to tell him about our podcast, but I don't know if the you know the the thingy is working. What are you gonna say? I don't know. I I was thinking like, hey, I'm Joe, and you're Matt, and you're Becky, and we host pre-recorded live every Tuesday. We talk about geeky stuff. You know, something you know like that. At pre-rec live on Twitter, Facebook.com backslash pre live, pre live dot wix dot com backslash podcast. Yeah. Okay. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, a bunch of podcast apps. Mm. All right. Well, okay. Is it ready? Yeah. Start talking now. Hi. Do you want to Netflix and chill, but you're not popular enough to have a girlfriend? Check out Netflix and Swill, where you can get drunk alone and listen to us ramble on about shit that's on Netflix. I've listened to Netflix and Swill for two whole episodes now. And they've helped cure my incurable loneliness. Thanks, Netflix and Swill, for letting me get so drunk and forgetting about all my problems. You can trust him. He's unbiased. I'm totally not a host for this show. So hop over to netflixandswill.podbean.com or check us out on iTunes. Bullshit from the news. Do you want to keep your cell phone conversations private? Well, Hush Me is a a new mask that you can wear to keep your cell phone conversations private from outside ears. And it looks like a fucking gag. Okay, so this little device that is currently, uh, look, I guess they're looking at like a Kickstarter campaign. It's called Hush Me, and it's basically, it's like this wrap-around mask thing. You, it plugs, it like Bluetooth connects to your cell phone. It's got little earbuds, and say you need to keep your cell phone conversation private. Like, what the fuck are you using a cell phone if it really, and out in an open area, if it needs to be private, whatever. But you put this little mask on, plug in your little earbuds, and... Not only does it muffle your voice from the outside, it also play, has a little speaker outside that plays like ocean sounds or birds or Darth Vader breathing. Totally one of the options to the outside so they can't hear you. I, I, it's a great idea for court reporters. It's a great idea for th- things that wouldn't use a uh, a cell phone. And I'm just, my brain is like, I'm sorry, I, I talk to a microphone all the time. I understand proximity effect and how microphones work. And if you had a mask wrapping your face, and I've, I've got a, a picture of this thing in the show notes at odddadout.blogspot.com. If you want to check, and even a link to their website, if you want to look into it again, even more. But <clears throat> this thing just wraps around, like wraps all the way around your head, and it covers your mouth, and it covers your mouth until you're like this. So, I'm sorry, but if you cover your mouth like this, the microphone is, even if it's on the inside, is going to sound weird. You're going to sound like you're in an echo chamber. So, this is a bad idea. Um, you're gonna sound all Darth Vader-y in the phone call you're in. Now, 
me being the asshole that I am, I love this thing for the idea of, hey, let's give these to fucking everybody so that I don't have to listen to them on their goddamn phone. Because I hate going anywhere and listening to people sitting there yammering on on their phones because for whatever the fuck reason, everybody out there seems to think that the ideal way to talk on your cell phone is to have it on speakerphone three feet from your fucking head. Like, there's a little earpiece. There's a microphone that's right fucking there. This thing is only a couple inches big. It's just the size of your face. It's it's miraculously about the distance between your ear and your mouth is the size of the cell phone. So how about you just put the goddamn thing up to your head like you're supposed to? I don't think everybody thinks they're going to get fucking irradiated and get a brain tumor from their cell phone. It's a myth. It's a myth. You're not going to get a brain tumor from your cell phone. You realize the... Im- amount of other crap that's emitting whatever the hell radiation your wi-fi in your house emits more dangerous radiation than your cell phone does you idiot if that's even the justification but i hate listening to people walking around talking on their damn speakerphone in public the only reason to have it on speakerphone is if you're talking to grandma and all the kids want to get in the conversation it's like here boys say happy birthday to grandma happy birthday that's what speakerphone is for. You've got multiple people in on the conversation. If you yourself are talking to another one person, don't fucking use your speakerphone. That's it. You know, or the people with shitty headsets that sit there and having to yell into their headset. The only time I use my headset is if I'm working, just so I can continue working, so I don't got to stop and pick up my phone because I need both hands. That's it. I've usually got my earbuds, I've usually got my headset in when I'm working anyway, because I'm usually listening to any number of podcasts that I've gone through to my list with you over the last few months. But yeah, I think give these fucking things to everybody, wrap them around their damn face so I don't have to hear you on your phone. I really don't make phone calls, I don't go out in public much, but I don't make phone a lot of phone calls in public. Most of the time, if I'm on the phone out in public... I'm like in the grocery store asking my wife about clarification on something on the list. Hey, what kind of chicken was it that was on sale? Are you sure? Because I can't find it. What kind of, like, what meat was it that was on sale? Oh, it's the 80 20. Oh, it's the 27. Well, fuck the 27. The 27 sucks. Shit, like, that's when I'm, that's my making a public phone call. And guess what? I hold the damn thing to my face. I don't even use my headset when I'm making phone calls in public. I don't ever use it for work. But yeah, stupid. It's a great idea to give to everybody else. I don't need the damn thing. Fuck you guys. And what the, and again, what are you, what kind of conversations are you having on your cell phone that you need some sort of private box thing? In, in their little promotional stuff, they got them like in office spaces and stuff and like, most office spaces, you aren't allowed to use, if you have like a secure, like, oh, I can't share this conversation. This is private information or secure information on this phone call. You can't have a cell phone. Now, if, if this was an accessory for like headsets for like call centers and things like that, or like insurance offices or something, or banks even, something like that where they handle a secure information and this was like a cool headset for them now so that they don't have to have like ultra silence or whatever in their, their offices. That's a good idea on a landline in a commercial setting for a cell phone. It's a dumb idea. It just is, you know, rethink your market guys. And again, if you are one of those people who needs to have a private conversation on your cell phone, go somewhere private. That's it. You're going to walk around with this thing in your face. No, <coughs> Okay, enough about uh, weird cell phone headsets. Totally not fitting with the rest of the news. On to the intoxication. Ha 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 ha. Okay. A church in Belgium turns into a beer bar after every Sunday mass. Yep. 
So, here's the deal. There's this little tent village in Belgium. There's like 400, 400, there's like 700 people, because I can't read. About 700 people. It was just kind of customary. You'd go to church, and after church, you went to the bar. And they'd, everybody would kind of congregate, have a pint, and then go on with their day. Well, it's a very small village. The last bar in town closed down. And to kind of keep up with uh, tradition, I don't want to say tradition, but kind of keep up, everybody kind of keeping up with their, their habits and everything, it was just a good meeting place. You know, it was everybody, they got up, they went to church, they went and have a, they won't go and have a drink and, and socialize and congregate and mingle and all that. Well, all the bars shut down. So what's everybody going to do? The local priest decided, you know what? We'll flip the bar or we'll flip the church into a bar. So. Every Sunday morning after Mass, they pull up the beer, they open up, and they have a beer, specifically a beer bar. And they start serving beer. Now, a couple of rules, to be fair. It's a church, after all, and they don't want anybody getting overly rowdy. So, in order to keep people from getting really rowdy, they institute rules like uh, no swearing. They cut off, I think it, they, they closed down the bar area at like one o'clock. So it's basically, you've got an hour or two after, after service to sit down and have a couple of drinks and then on your merry way. No fighting, no swearing, no, you know, no getting out of hand. And they don't want people getting out of hand because after all, it is still a church. But numero uno rule, cause I don't speak Belgian. You have to attend Mass. You can't just show up at the church bar after Mass. You have to attend service. And then everyone gets up and they help flip tables or whatever. that set up tables and stuff for the bar. And it's apparently really helping the church attendance. Because, come on, if they're going to be serving beer at church, I think a lot more people would start going here too. But, yeah, it's just kind of... It's a it's a fun little bit. I think it's just kind of funny. There's like, hey, there's nowhere in town to drink. So the priest goes, hey, you can drink here at the church. You just have to attend service. Ha ha ha. Sneaky, sneaky. Uh, but it's a cool idea. And it's it's at least it's doing something for the community. That's that's church outreach right there. That's that's really that's a church that's really looking out for the people in the village. And again, there's only 700 people in this town. So. In all likelihood, you're probably going to have most of that 700 cruising through those doors. You're going to have to expand the church bar. But it's pretty funny. And, yeah, I, I just got a chuckle out of that. Uh. <coughs> Excuse me. Continuing on the theme of uh, intoxication. This is great. And if, if if this bar were in in Colombia, this would be even better for them. A reinterpreted law means Colombians can now go to work drunk or high as long as it does not affect their job performance. They basically just like kind of looked at the... It's one of those like, oh, it's open to interpretation. It's when somebody looks at the laws and all this stuff and says, hey, doesn't this mean under the way this is written that I could do this like this way? And that's basically what they did in Colombia. It's like they looked at the law and they said, hey, well, the way the labor law is written, I'm, I'm, I can totally show up to work high off my ass as long as it doesn't affect my job. Because that's totally what people in Colombia sound like. I don't know why I always default to that really, like, Appalachian accent. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I think if I went for a Colombian accent, I'd probably offend more people anyway. But I'm, I'm, I'm actually totally down for this, and I'll tell you why. I have worked, again, I was a restaurant manager for 13 years. I have worked with people, hi, 
I've worked with people who showed up to work drunk. I've worked with people who showed up to work high. I've worked with people who showed up to work high every day. I've worked with people who showed up high to work at nine o'clock in the morning. That's commitment to your habit there. But what I have found is that there are some people who work well sober. I don't do drugs. For the most part, I don't drink. I could not function. Okay, I don't do drugs. I have no clue how I would deal if I were smoking weed or doing something. But I know on prescription pain meds I'm useless, but that's because they just generally make me sick. But I I don't know how I would react if I were intoxicated, but I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be able to function properly at work. I don't want to test that theory. But I've worked with people who work better high. Really. That they just... It's like they're so used to being under the influence. They're so used to always smoking, so used to always having a little bit of a something in their system that they actually work better high than they do sober. So, like, I, I, I have to, I kind of have to go with this. And that was always kind of my, like, as a manager, that was always kind of my thing was I don't care what you do on your free time. You're not smoking weed at my at the store. But if you smoke before work and you show up high, as long as you are able to do your job satisfactorily, I don't give a shit. That was always my rule. Now there were people that started getting way out of hand and they'd show up so wasted they couldn't find their fucking feet. And they got fired. But those guys who showed up to work every day and their eyes were red as fuck, but they were the fastest cooks on my line and they were able to keep up and not a problem. Fuck, I don't care. I really, hell, my first boss when I was 16, you know, talking about like in orientation day and because he was kind of chill like that. His, always, his joke was always like, what's the, what's my first rule about uh, using drugs at work. Was like, don't get hurt and don't get caught. Was like, don't get caught. <laughs> and uh, don't get hurt because the insurance is going to have to do a drug test. Those were the rules. And there was always a joke because I had like dental work done. I'm sitting there popping those prescription strength uh, ibuprofen and shit. And he's like, hey, what did I tell you about doing drugs at work? Was like, don't get caught. <laughs> So I've always had, I personally, and I'm, and I'm not a big, like, I, I'm not so crazy about drug use and stuff like that. I don't use drugs. If my kids use drugs, I will probably beat them senseless. But that's more on account of just the general illegality of it. It's like, you're not going to go around breaking the law. Sorry. That's it. If it was legal, that's another situation. But here, right now, man, recreationally is not legal. So you'll stay within the law. Either way, I've, I've always been kind of chill when it comes to uh, recreational drug use, as long as it doesn't make you a freaking idiot. So I totally, I totally get this, and I totally like this law: be drunk, be high, as long as it doesn't affect your work, get your shit done, and I don't care what the hell you do, really. I don't care if you need to shoot heroin to get through the night. If you have to shoot heroin to get through the night and function properly, hell, if it helps you function, function. I had a boss at one point who literally hired crackheads on purpose because they were faster workers. He hired strung out crackheads because they were the fastest people in the kitchen. That's some, that's some thinking outside the box. That's also thinking out in the box of a drug user. But, hey, whatever gets the job done. Uh, speaking of getting high, or maybe not getting high, somebody donated 60 ounces of marijuana to Goodwill. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't on purpose. <laughs> uh, Goodwill workers in Monroe, Washington 
opened up a donated cooler, like your your standard igloo rolling cooler, like your beer cooler, and found five bags of weed inside. 60 ounces, which I'm not doing the math, but that's several pounds of weed. And according to the article, it says that is 60 times the legal amount to possess in Washington. Again, Washington state is a uh, marijuana, recreational marijuana is legal there, but you can only possess an ounce for recreational use, like at a time. I think you can grow more than, I think you like, you can grow one plant and you can possess one ounce for recreational use, whatever. I don't know the, how far an ounce of weed goes. I don't smoke. We just went over this. But yeah, they had a cooler full of weed and I got a picture of it and the cops sitting there all smiley. Hey, look, here's a big old fucking cooler full of weed. What an idiot. Uh, they've had a bunch of people trying, they like posted up, Hey, is this your weed? And the police have had a bunch of people trying, like, calling, trying to claim it. And like, oh, yeah, that's mine. Can you return it to me? And nobody showed up to claim it. They're like, oh, yeah, we're not sending it to you, dumbass. But, yeah, apparently they're, it's it's getting right. It's, like, in the group of stuff that gets burned as evidence. They're like, oh, yeah, this is, like, drugs and things like that. Whenever police have it, they, like, burn it. So it's in line to get incinerated. I guess there's going to be a lot of people hanging outside the police incinerator that day. But now it's time to take my last little promo break. And I will be right back with this week's recommended listening. Want to know the story behind Pottern Family? Pottern Family started with a hashtag for indie podcasters. The podcasters who do this for fun and because we're passionate. We're not the big podcast you hear about, most likely. We don't have 10 to 15 people helping us with production. But that doesn't mean the quality and content you're getting isn't as good as any of those shows. Is there an area of interest you like talking to people about? Listen to an indie podcast on that topic. The hosts are incredibly reachable. We're basically clamoring to hear from listeners. We're just as much your fans as you are ours. No matter what you're interested in, Pottern Family's got a show for you. Like movies and TV? Check out the Epic Film Guys, the Something Something cast, the Boxers, or the Countdown Movie and TV Review. Do you like comedy? Check out Everyone Has a Podcast, the One Word Go Show, Afterburn 739, Now That I'm Older, Rick and Paul Heal the World, or off in the weeds. How about random trivia and fun facts? Check out The Endless Knot, or The Story Behind. Like comic books and geek culture? Check out Geek Yogurt Podcast, or Little Geek Lost. I could go on, and believe me when I say there are a whole lot more where that came from. But you can find all these and more by searching the hashtag Potter and Family on Twitter. What's up, guys? This is Epic Film Guy Nick here, and I just want to take a few moments to tell you about an excellent podcast that I personally listen to called Ice and the Face. All right, now, if you're a fan of dystopian and even nihilistic comedy, this is the show for you. Rick and Sarah take the most ridiculous news items in the world every single week, and they just tear these stories down, all while having a great, great laugh. They're usually joined by guests who jump right in on the fun, and it's just a great time. They just launched a Patreon over at patreon.com slash ice in the face, so you can also support them. But if you're not listening to this show, what you need to do is go to their website at iceintheface.com, or jump over on your favorite podcasting app and subscribe to Ice in the Face. I promise you'll listen for two minutes and you will be hooked just like I am. So go ahead and give it a listen and back to your regularly scheduled program. And that would be me. So Ice in the Face. This is, like he said, this is Rick and Sarah. 
and just go back to the official documentation. Ice in the face is Rick and Sarah, respectively. This is a NSFW dystopian comedy podcast released once a week for your ear holes to soak up and expel accordingly. We dive deep into the ridiculous shit happening in the world today and laugh heartily at all of its absurdity as it burns to the ground. We subscribe to our one rule, hilarity over feelings. Now, the best way I can describe Ice in the Face is my bullshit from the news segment. A lot dirtier. Whereas you could say more on account of language that my news segment is probably R-rated. Primarily based on language. Uh, Ice in the Face is basically that entire thing for an hour, hour and a half, sometimes two hours, where a lot weirder stories, and they get a lot more vibe, a lot more vulgar, a lot dirtier, uh, a lot more sexual stories. I don't know how many times I've heard stories them of them covering about somebody having their penis stuck in a something. Um, they're absolutely hilarious. They are. The, if I'm R-rated, they're NC-17 or adults only or whatever. Absolutely not safe for work. I'm not safe for kids. They're not safe for work. They, they get into stuff and they get so raunchy and so dirty and just... Sometimes it's a bit much. I'll say it. Um, they're hilarious, and and the snark and the sarcasm, and every the and the play between them is great. It's they just they they just rip everything up. It's so bad. Uh, it's a fun show to listen to, but. Man, you've, you've got to have a thick skin. You've got to be able to handle it because, and I don't mean thick skin like, oh, they're going to offend you because if you're listening to them more, you, if you get past the opening, uh, ads for the sponsors, if you get past that undercover condom sponsor, you should be good because I've never had somebody talk about, uh, penises for so long, so often. With such enthusiasm. <laughs> they have a condom sponsor. That's just it. Um, they go on about undercover condoms at great length at the beginning of every show. Uh, but if you can get past that promo, I think you can probably handle the rest of this show. But they just, they cover all this crazy, same, like, weird news stuff. Even some of the same stories I cover, they, cover it in a very different way. And I'm that nerd who sits there and reads the details on all the stories. Sometimes they'll just go by the headline and make fun of the, because of the headline, because who needs the details when you're making fun of shit? I want to make fun of the details. That's it. Maybe that's why, you know, big difference, but they're an awesome show. Um, I honestly, I, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's my preference towards females. I like Sarah more. I think that that's just me. And maybe it's because she doesn't get now, not to say she, she gets dirty. She does. But I think she sometimes when, uh, when Rick and the guests frequently stones, when they get really out there, she tries to bring them back. She tries to bring them back from the depths of whatever nasty, whatever the hell uh rabbit hole of hell that they can drag off into that we all can drag off into some crazy rabbit hole but man you don't want to stick your hand in the rabbit hole they got into she'll try and bring them back into something she'll try and 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 bring it back into some semblance of a topic on on hand but she can keep up with them. She's it, she's not some some fairy princess. Um, but yeah, they're it's a really cool show. It's a really awesome show. If you think I they're, they're I'm a you could say that my bullshit from the news is a very is a much tamer version of their entire show. Essentially, uh, incidentally, not ripping them off. I started doing this segment before. 
I started listening to them. And really, I it's one of those things where they popped up all the time when I'd search out Potter and Family. They're one of those big players. They're one of those really out there, really promoting. You'd see Ice in the Face. Everybody's talking about Ice in the Face. And so I had to give it a listen. I was like, okay, much like uh, Dark Angels and Pretty Freaks. It's just one of those, they're always, everybody's always talking about them. Everybody's always saying how great they are. So what do I do? I was like, fine, I got to check it out. What's all the hype about? And it's another one of those where the description doesn't exactly help you, help you with, it's, it's a good description. It describes their style, but it doesn't, the whole dystopian pot, the dystopian comedy podcast, like, my brain is thinking this is something out of Fallout. But like, no, they're making fun of the news. They're just generally sitting there breaking down all the stupidity and weird what the fuck's in the news, which is why I have bullshit from the news. And again, they do it on a much bigger scale with a partner. Because I'm sure my segment would be a lot worse if I had somebody to talk to besides you, dear listener. But... They do it with somebody else in the room. Sometimes with more than one somebody else in the room. And so, yeah, they kind of up the, they, they turn dial up to 11 on the breaking down weird shit news. But it's absolutely a hilarious show. If it's your style at all, if you can, if you are into that weird news, just making fun of stupid bullshit, this is absolutely the show for you. So check out Ice in the Face at iceintheface.com. Before I go, I just want to give a big thank you to you, dear listener, for putting up with me and listening this far in. It's always great to see that there are people listening and putting up with my crap on a regular basis. Besides my wife, she doesn't have a choice. But... It's really awesome, and if you enjoy the show, I, 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 I'm asking you now, tell a friend. If you know somebody who'd be interested, share it. Let them know. Uh, share on your Facebook or Twitter or whatnot, and tag me at Odd Dad Out on Facebook or Twitter. Send them over to odddadout.blogspot.com where they can catch all of the back episodes and all of the fun news stories that I've had here this week and maybe some weird pictures. Or if maybe not just me, maybe you can send them over to the recommended listening page and they can find another show they like because it's still March for a bit and it is still Tripod Month and I've got shows all across the weird little spectrum of stuff over there. So, nice plug, huh? Uh, (laughs) If you are so inclined, head over to odddeadout.blogspot.com, hit one of the subscribe buttons, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spreaker, and leave me a review if you are so inclined. If you love it, great, tell me. If you hate it, great, tell me. I can't get any better if you don't tell me what you hate. And if you hate it, even better because that's gross. It's it's learning. But enough rambling. I think we're done here tonight. So until next week, I've been Adam Higgins, the Odd Dad Out. Thank you and good night.